according to Buddhism, the Dhamma, Dukkha is not Dukkha until it is, it has become, it has been made aware of, rather. The individual is aware of it. But we don't stop there. That's the first step. In order for Dukkha to really be significant enough, it needs to be made aware of and it requires wisdom to take that awareness. and apply it. When I say apply it, we're talking about understanding the Dukkha. So we do not run away from the Dukkha. The person has to be present to the Dukkha. The person has to be present for the Dukkha, the suffering. So we can't just sit there and say, well, I'm aware of it. Yes, and then what? One can be fighting with it. Directly with dukkha, with suffering. Which means that you're aware of it while you're fighting against it. That's why you're fighting against it. But that's not going to serve our purpose. Serving the purpose meaning having it be related to what the Buddha taught in the body of the Four Noble Truths. So in order for it to turn into the First Noble Truth, it needs the person needs to become aware of and have the capacity to discern the Dukkha. So you're very much present. With no agendas, no nothing. Just looking at the dukkha. Looking at the mind, observing it with a mind that is ready to perceive Whatever is going on, the fluctuations that are occurring in the mind due to the dukkha, due to the suffering. And that's why the Buddha talks about sati and sampajanya. Mindfulness or awareness of the mind, but we don't stop there, as I said earlier. We need to have it hold the hands of wisdom or discernment. Then we're talking. Otherwise, dukkha is wasted. So let's not waste dukkha, if that makes sense. A different way of looking at it. Otherwise, well, most of the time, we're actually living a life that we are shunning and running away from dukkha in one way or another, in one shape or another. Sugarcoating it. We have different kinds of formulas, different ways of protecting ourselves, buffering ourselves from dukkha, including in case of people who know a little bit of Buddhism or a lot of the Dhamma, I mean, just technical or intellectually, um, understand the principles. Many times they can splash on the colors, the paint bucket of the Four Noble Truths. Philosophically, intellectually, they can analyze it to bits. That's the case with commentators, usually. All of which are simply trying to create a distance between the mind and the experience of Dukkha. That is Dukkha being wasted. Dukkha needs to be understood. The relationship with dukkha needs to be understood, and we cannot have that understanding 
unless there is the presence of one, sati, and two, discernment or wisdom. These two have to be there. Otherwise, we've wasted an opportunity with the dukkha at hand, whatever shape, however shape it is in. Another thing that many people don't consider or forget about is the relationship between, uh, well, the relationship that children have with dukkha, rather. We can start very young, at a very young age, educating children how to deal with dukkha, appreciating dukkha, understanding dukkha, the suffering stress, the pain. So an ideal school would be something like a place where, or it doesn't have to be a physical place, but a teaching methodology where a child is taught the mechanisms of how suffering starts. For example, if the child is taught that if they hold on tightly to this thing that they want, they're going to experience suffering. They're going to experience dukkha. And a child will get this very quickly. Instead of having to spend 20, 30 years of their lives banging their heads this on this and that, and this sense pleasure or that, futile effort in achieving some form of happiness, traveling around the world, whatever, backpacking, I don't know, doing drugs, ayahuasca, you name it, and still not being able, and if they're lucky enough, one day they'll come across the teachings of the Buddha. And if they are really lucky enough, they will find the Four Noble Truths to be interesting. And if they're really, really, really lucky, they will find a teacher who will be able to elaborate that key, crucial teaching of Lord Buddha to them. Yes, they would have a library of dukkha experiences, but I think many of those would have been much minimized tremendously if they had been shown Instead of how to play baseball, for example, or basketball, in addition to that, they could have actually learned the mechanisms as to why, why, why do we actually suffer. It's so simple. There's a dis-ease in the mind, in the body. The question needs to arise, why? This is something that we skip altogether because we want to cover it up with something else. We want to completely avoid that suffering by piling on top of it an ice cream layer. So we don't see the pain. We drag ourselves to a different sense of pleasure, a different item. Instead of why am I suffering? Hold on there. Why, why, why am I feeling this way? I have everything I need around me. Why am I in pain? This, this sense of uh, discontent. What's, what is that? That's a huge, huge... Uh, it's a big deal. To pause and ask the question. Next, the person says, Okay, why is this happening? What am I feeling first? And then why am I feeling this? And if they have been given the very simple formula, first, noble truth is, there is suffering. So with the first question they've identified, oh, this is suffering. Ah, what is that? That is dukkha. And now we come to the how or why. And then they see, ooh, I'm suffering because, if they've been taught well, my teacher said, if you hold on to something so tightly, if you are glued to it, if you want it to be done in a certain way, something happens 
to happen in a certain way that you want, that is the holding on tightly. Oh, so I'm suffering, one. Two, the why part is because I'm holding on to it too tight. Ah! So basically you're saying if I don't hold on to it so tightly, I'm not going to suffer? Yeah! That's the third noble truth. Oh, okay, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Pretty simple. But is there a way? Is there a way that I can actually make sure that I protect myself from further suffering as best as I can? Yeah! And that's the step-by-step -step guide, which is called the Magga, or the path. The instruction manual, if you will, of the Eightfold Path. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right lifestyle, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness of mind. Flowing into each other. But the crucial one, obviously, is always right view. We miss the right, you know, we miss that first step. We're going elsewhere. That's one of the huge steps, which is the absence of which is always, not usually, but always, the cause for the downfall of so many who have been on the path or tried to get on the path, the right understanding, the harmonious perspective, the right view, that, that right view part. Being, you know, having the, the eye's sight in the mind, in the heart, to see what is right from what is wrong and to identify when your certain uh, tendencies whether it's greed or attachment or anger or hatred or just careless attention to things are leading your life or not. The steps you are about to take in this or that direction, what is the impetus for these? What is the driving force for you to lean into wanting to do this thing, to say this thing? to think in this manner. What is the driving force behind it? Is it coming out of greed? Is it coming out of anger? Some sense of spite, hatefulness? Or is it or something like you want to become like an ostrich or something and just become careless about what is needed to be dealt with right now? instead of being shoved aside. Which takes us back into a full loop, back to what we were talking about in the beginning, which is Dhamma, uh, I'm sorry, which is the, the Dukkha being um, wasted or not. Wasted or not. For which purpose there must be, in order for it not to be wasted, that is, there must be awareness or mindfulness closely tied in together with discernment, wisdom. So working with children even, not just children, but my suggestion is that we can actually um, save on time and energy and life wasted because we don't know if the child is going to grow up into their 20s, 30s, etc. So the sooner the better that the child gets to learn about these principles and develop a sense of appreciation for the Four Noble Truths. that the sooner they come to understand the path, 
fruit and Nibbana. Sometimes people forget that two of the youngest Arahants were seven years old each. Seven-year-old kids, <laughs> Arahants, walking around. Children. Do you remember what you used to do when you were seven? Well, add to that the fact that you could have been an Arahant. Fully enlightened being. <laughs> but a child needs to be given those opportunities. And of course that has tremendous you know, uh, 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 connection actually. Uh, it has a strong connection with their work, the, the work that was done in the past. The merits. Have they accrued enough merits to come to to be reborn in a time where there is the Dhamma, where they have access to the Dhamma, and where there is a, a, an individual or people, beings, teaching the Dhamma? And are they able to listen to the Dhamma? The biggest ingredient. So these are some of the thoughts that I want to share this morning.